in Google, when you search for the term the Brass Age, you get the singular declaration that there was no Brass Age, according to the Copper Development Association. It says there was no Brass Age because for many years it was not easy to make brass. For the 18th century, zinc metal could not be made since it melts at 420 degrees Celsius and boils at about 950 degrees Celsius below the temperature needed to reduce the zinc oxide with charcoal. So, <clears throat> under the Wikipedia page, Metal Ages, we get a explanation of their official criteria or um, the designation of Metal Age. The Metal Ages, or the Metal Ages, yes, is a term for the period of human civilization beginning about 6,000 years ago during which metallurgy rapidly advanced in human population started using metals, copper, tin, bronze, and finally iron to make tools and weapons. By heating and shaping materials not in hot furnaces, people also learned to use precious metals such as gold and silver to make intricate ornaments with these technical adaptations. Human society became more productive and human settlements became larger and more prosperous, but also more violent. The Middle Ages are divided into three stages, the copper, bronze, and the iron age. And of course, uh, we could make the comment here that iron is easier to uh, work with than bronze a alloy but there's more to the story in the book the god kings and the titans by james bailey the new world ascendancy in ancient times there's a explanation or a uh, more in-depth explanation of the criteria for the so-called metal ages. Here on um, page 144, closer to the or the last two paragraphs, states, it was metal hunger that had set them voyaging. The need for copper and tin, it was iron that helped put a stop to it. For iron is ubiquitous and plentiful. The understanding of how to work iron and iron ore put paid to these travels put pay to these travels, I believe. But it was not just the fall in the price of tin. Three of the great periods of social upheaval have been caused by the coming of iron, iron for cosmetics, iron for war, and iron for industry. They say it was iron that freed the slaves. I don't know who says that. Uh, certainly the Bronze Age empires possessed the capital to draw their supplies of bronze from across the world, which the outside barbarians conspicu conspicuously lacked. And iron or steel sword was not better than a bronze sword, but it was cheaper. The outer barbarian could, with the coming of iron, arm themselves properly and fit out large armies for raiding the wealthy empires they, that had survived so long. They destroyed these flourishing states, or they crippled their power. From Iron had such a devastating effect, and the setback it gave in its first arrival as steel to the affairs of men was appalling. It could be compared to the results of atomic war. All the memory of this former culture lay buried in the ruins of these cities. Only the peasants tilling the fields passed on to each other in a st form steadily more corrupt legends of what had happened, basically. So that's the criteria for the Middle Ages, and it all revolves around warfare. Now, of course, we're going to find later that that criteria is problematic for various reasons. Now, in modern firearms... Brass is the primary component for the casings. In a modern cartridge, there are essentially three components. You have the bullet, you have the powder, you have the charge or the primer, and you have the casing. Now, the bullets are generally speaking made out of things like lead for the core, and then a surrounding uh, metal such as copper but the casings are generally made out of brass. Now there are other casings uh, made from different metals, such as steel or mostly steel, but the brass casing is the most common. And the brass casings are not only used in the small projectiles of small arms, such as uh, rifles, pistols, uh, etc. But it's also used in artillery, such as mortars, or the projectiles that come out of cannons. Now, before the brass casing was used, the platform itself, such as the 
pistol, rifle, or uh, cannon was made out of bronze in order to handle the pressures of the charge and the bullet being fired. And we find these things with Kappa ball revolvers and other armaments. But with the cannon itself, a breech loader from the 1860s, the middle of the 19th century, we find a strangely similar uh, design to the modern cartridge. See, it's a breech loader, and so when it opens in the back, you find the circular well in which the primer is seated in modern cartridges. It's very apparent that the idea of a brass weapon was reduced down into the brass casings that we have today. And that's how that innovation happened. Now we can contrast this clear understanding to the official narrative around the development of the cartridge. Here it states, paper cartridges have been used for centuries with a number of historians dating their usage as far back as the late 14th and 15th centuries. Historians note their use by soldiers of Christian I, Elector of Saxony, and his son in the late 16th century. While the Dresden Army has evidence dating their use to 1591, Capo Bianco wrote in 1597 that paper cartridges had long been used, used by the Neapolitan soldiers. I suppose that has to do with... I'm not sure what Neapolitan means, maybe city soldiers, like Neapolitan or Metropolitan, whatever. The use became widespread in the 17th century. The 1586 round consisted of a charger powder and a bullet and a paper cartridge. Thick paper is still known as cartridge paper from its use in these cartridges. Another source states that the cartridge appeared in 1590. King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden had his troops used cartridges in the 1600s. The paper formed a cylinder with twisted ends. The ball was at one end and a measured powder filled the rest. This cartridge was used with the muzzleloading of military firearms, probably more often than sporting shooting. I, bl I believe what they're talking about is muskets. The base of the cartridge being ripped or bitten off by the soldier, the powder poured into the barrel, and the paper and bullet rammed down the barrel. In the Civil War era cartridge, the paper was supposed to be discarded, but soldiers often used it as a wad. To enact the charge in an additional se step was required where fine-grained powder, called priming powder, was poured into the pan of the gun to be ignited by the firing mechanism. The evolving nature of warfare acquired a firearm that could load and fire more rapidly, resulting in the flintlock musket and later the Baker rifle, in which the pan was covered by furrowed steel. This was struck by a flint and fired in the gun. In the course of loading, a pinch of powder from the cartridge would be placed in the pan as priming before the rest of the cartridge was rammed down the barrel, providing charge of wadding. Now, this was written clearly by somebody who has no concept or understanding of it, specifically how firearms actually work. They don't have any, as they would term it, military experience. Right, because they're talking about quote unquote military firearms. As if there's no other use of firearms of military or sporting reasons. So they're applying a more modern understanding uh, of weaponry to earlier centuries in which that doesn't actually apply. However, what they're talking about here is the musket, which in the modern form today would take the uh, the role of the Shotgun. Shotgun is smooth bore, and so is the musket. And we might not have any more uh, muzzle loading shotguns, but we do have breech loading shotguns. And in the 1860s, a lot of the things that were used were breech loaders. I mean, they still use muskets, but they had many other types of weapons as well, which is well known. And they also had rifles around the time that apparently muskets were ubiquitous. Well, nowadays, most people who lack the training to use rifles or other types of rifle contraptions like a pistol, they would use a shotgun. Shotguns are really well known for being uh, a um, less experienced person's weapon of choice. And so that's how we can compare it to the uh, musket. So their perspective of the development of the cartridge mainly relies on the musket and the evolution into the shotgun, but does not actually cover the innovation of the brass casing. So the reason why they don't want you to understand anything about a such a thing as a brass age has to do with the United States Constitution and where the innovation most likely came from. 
being the uh, Constitution of the United States before the 1860s, when the foreign invasion took over. Here it states that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So that's one of their responsibilities, is the providing for the defense and general welfare. Naturally, that's going to have to do with the development of firearms. Also, the Congress has the responsibility, not the right or privilege, right? Responsibility and duty to provide and maintain a Navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, and to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So we find evidence of what form this took from the springfieldarmory.com forward slash intel forward slash about. Here it states, in 1777, George Washington ordered the creation of Springfield Armory to store ammunition and gun carriages for the American Revolutionary War. 1794, the armory began manufacturing muskets for a young country. For the next 150 years, it functioned as a supplier for every major American conflict, as well as a think tank for new firearm concepts. So basically, if you want to put this into a understandable context, public armories existed before the takeover of foreign corporate interests in the 1860s. So before that time period, you had publicly funded armories. That means that they were funded through the only enumerated tax in the U.S. Constitution, the one that has to do with the census, and their purpose was to provide effective mechanisms and means. They didn't have to worry about things like profit and loss. They, didn't, they were not a corporation. They were there to serve the people, being the people as the militia, right? The militia being the people of fighting capabilities for the security of a free state. Naturally, if you're a foreign adversary who took these things over, uh, on behalf of private corporate interests, well, you would not You would want to undermine the security of free state, and you would have want to seize production. So these specific places, these publicly funded armories, would be an issue for the uh, foreign investors, the foreign uh, invasion and insurrectionists. Naturally, they would want to erase any understanding of the innovations that took place under a, as they would call it, an unregulated system. That's because the regulation in the Constitution is completely diametrically opposed to their regulation because they, uh, the fake phony government that we have today, is in fact a private corporation acting on behalf of foreign investor interests. Whereas at this time, they were publicly funded entities that acted on behalf of the domestic interests of the people to serve. Then, in 1968, citing budgetary concerns, the U.S. government closed Springfield Armory. Now the walls of Springfield Armory would house historians paying homage to the past rather than those with an the future. Of course, that is the uh, foreign corporation pretending to be government that did that, because such a entity, like all of the other publicly funded armories, would had been a problem for them, and they didn't want them around anymore. Now, in this book, The Great Ship from Amicon, Annals of Macau and the Old Japan Trade, 1555 to 1640, we get an explanation of how the alleged conflict between iron and bronze was still going farther, going on farther into the period when allegedly the uh, bronze and iron age had already ended. Now, this book uh, apparently was first published in 1960 but this states was reprinted in 1963. However, another book, pretty much the same book that I came across, The Great Ship from Amicon, Annals of Macau, and the Old Japan Trade, 1555 to 1640, cites a different date. Here it is written, Center of Ultramarine Historical Studies, Lisbon, 1959. So that's interesting. Either way, in the reprint from 1963, it talks about bronze cannon. Here it states, Japanese copper also formed an important item in the last years of the Macau Japan trade, being chiefly used as the celebrated gun foundry operated by Manuel Tavares Bocajo at Macau, circa 1627-1650, whose bronze cannon were famous all over the east. Finally, there was at 
one time a su substantial export of slaves from Japan, including Korean and prisoners of war. Also in the same book, the reprint from 1963. Having finally concluded a truce with the English in January, the Conde de Linares freighted the East Indiamen London, Captain Willis to sail to Macau and bring back to Goa the cannon, copper, and other goods awaiting shipment there. The Portuguese hoped in this way to evade the close Dutch blockade of the Straits of Malacca, which was now maintained virtually all the year around. Nor were they disappointed in their hopes. The commander of the Dutch squadron, which met the London on her return voyage in November, reluctantly let her pass. Although she was laden to sinking point with the goods of our mortal enemies, the Portuguese, as he bitterly reported to his superiors at Batavia. The London reached Goa in safety and landed there her cargo of Japanese copper and Boca Ho's bronze cannon. The success of this voyage induced the English to repeat the experiment later, until finally the Dutch lost patience and seized the Bon Espérance when on a similar mission in 1643. Here in Britannica, we get an explanation of the difference between bronze and iron cannon. Cast iron cannon were significantly heavier and bulkier than bronze can guns, bearing the same weight of ball. Unlike bronze cannon, they were prone to internal corrosion. Moreover, when they failed, they did not tear and rupture like bronze guns, but burst into fragments like a bomb. They possessed, however, the overwhelming advantage of costing only about one-third as much. This gave the English, who alone mastered the process and well into the 17th century, a significant commercial advantage by enabling them to arm a large number of ships. Mediterranean nations were unable to cast significant quantities of iron artillery into well into the 19th century. So first, we should note here that this is stating that the English alone mastered the process of making bronze cannon. Well, that's contrary to what we read before, in which the Portuguese were, in fact, making the bronze cannon that went into the hands of the British. However, if cost is not an issue, as it would be for private enterprises of foreign interests, then such a thing as brass cannon would not be a cost uh, a costly armament to make, considering the Constitution of the United States at the time had a wealth of resources at their disposal and didn't have to worry about things like the bottom line of a corporate uh, balance sheet, right? So here we get into this uh, uh, issue of the caseless ammunition which sounds quite similar to their alleged paper cartridge. Here it states, many governments and companies continue to develop caseless ammunition, where the entire case assembly is either consumed when the round fires or whatever, whatever remains is ejected with the bullet. So far, none has been successful enough to reach the civilian market and gain commercial success. Even within the military market, uh, the use is limited. Around 1848, Sharps introduced a rifle and paper cartridge containing everything but the primer system. When new, these guns had significant gas leaks at the chamber end, and with use, these leaks progressively worsened. This problem plagues caseless cartridges and gun systems to this day. The Daisy Hedden VL single shot rifle, which used a caseless round in the 22 caliber, was produced by the Air Gun Company beginning in 1968. Apparently, Daisy never considered the gun an actual firearm. In 1969, the ATF ruled it was a fact firearm, illegitimately, I might add which Daisy was not licensed to produce. Production of the guns and the ammo was discontinued in 1969. They're still available on the secondary market, mainly as collector items. As most owners report the accuracy is not good. So before I move on to the next part of this uh, page, we should note here that the ATF or alcohol or um, BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, is a fraudulent government entity, not legitimate under the Constitution, acting on behalf of foreign interests with the design, as all of these other operations are, to undermine the security of a free state, as it states in the Second Amendment. Now, the issue with the banning of things that are problematic for foreign investor interests, uh, it does not just have to do with this particular uh, item but also takes on a different character when we talk about the green tip bullets, as they're usually called, of the 5.56 NATO round. Now, the United States military is provided ammunition now today from private corporations, whereas in the past, they and everybody else, all of the members of the militia, that being domestic populace, would have been provided arm, arm, uh, armament 
they could of course buy their own from private corporations, but they would have easily accessible arms from publicly funded armories because those armories, like the Springfield Armory, were not corporations. They were publicly funded institutions with their entire purpose to provide arms to the populace. Now, when a private investor corporation takes over and through insurrection and invasion, essentially, the legitimate government, they close these things down and they make only private corporations able to process and to make arms, not publicly funded institutions like the Springfield Armory was. In that manner, the U.S. military can only get ammunition from private corporations. And that's the reason why the so-called Green Tip 556 round is, is um, still around. Versus, of course, the so-called cop killers, which were uh, other metal cord uh, handgun bullets, basically. Those were banned, and thus the military cannot acquire them because the military is reliant on the private corporations to produce their ammunition. And thus we find a trail to uh, through the development of these cartridges the cartridge alone, really, uh, as well as the bullet, about what life was like in uh, the time before the so-called Civil War. Anyway, in continuation, in 18, 1989, Hitler and Kulk, a prominent German firearms manufacturer, began advertising, advertising the G11 assault rifle, which shot a 4.73 by 33 square caseless round. The round was mechanically fired with an integral primer. 1993, Vore of Austria began selling a gun and caseless ammunition. Their system used a primer electronically fired at 17.5. I'm not sure what that symbol means, a, a plus over a minus, 2 volts. The upper and lower limits prevent fire from either straight currents or static electricity. Direct electrical firing eliminates the mechanical delays associated with the striker, reducing lock time and allowing for easier adjustment of the rifle trigger. In both instances, the case was molded directly from solid nitrocellulose, which is itself relatively strong and inert. Bolt and primer are glued into the propellant block.